Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and good day to all. In our previous session, we looked at moving shock waves and the techniques to solve problems related to it. In this session, we are going to extend our study by looking at cases where a moving shock wave inside a tube is reflected off a wall at the end of the tube. This picture shows a cylindrical tube with a shock inside it, moving towards the left. Prior to this, it was moving to the right and reflecting off the end of the tube wall on the right. You can also see that the shock causes some obvious changes to the gas properties across the shock and also near the tube wall. We can ask a few questions about this. How is this reflecting shock wave going to affect the gas properties in the tube? Can we predict these changes? How much is the gas pressure going to increase due to this reflected shock? If the gas pressure increases drastically, will the tube wall be able to withstand that pressure? More importantly, what do we need to know about the shock and its reflection so that we can design a better cylinder for whatever purpose we intend for it? It's important to note that a shock wave can occur inside a tube due to two major factors. Number one, from an internal explosion inside the tube. And number two, due to the sudden motion of a large object inside the tube, for example, due to the oscillating motion of a piston. When it comes to shock waves inside the tube, we have a special case where you have both events happening at once, which is inside the combustion engine. Inside the cylindrical tube of the engine, you have a piston oscillating back and forth at thousands of times per minute. Then, at one point in every cycle, you have a small explosion of fuel being detonated or ignited by the spark plug of the engine to power up the piston cycle. So, it seems likely that shock waves will always occur here, right? Not quite. It's not going to produce huge shock wave if it's operating properly. In fact, if the conditions in the engine are right, and if all the processes go on as designed, there'll be only very weak shock waves inside the cylindrical tube that's not going to affect the operation of the engine. But if the timing is not right between the piston cycle and the fuel explosion, then strong shock waves will be produced, and that's not a good thing. It'll produce a loud knocking sound when the engine is started, and it will ultimately reduce the efficiency of the piston engine. Obviously, we don't want this thing to happen, so it is very important for us to understand at least the basic dynamics of shock waves inside this tube of the piston engine, or any cylindrical tubes in general. In the case of the piston engine, our knowledge of the shock wave can help us predict what effects it has on the gas and the piston, and ultimately design the piston engine properly to reduce the occurrence of any shocks and maximize its efficiency. Let's look in a bit more detail on the motion of a piston in this slide. Here in this picture, you have the piston inside a cylindrical tube moving to the right. On top of it, you have the graph of the motion of the piston. The x-axis is the position of the piston and the y-axis is the time taken for the front of the piston to be at any one location in the tube. If we follow through the piston movement bit by bit, we can trace this black curve that shows how the piston moves forward in space the x-axis, and in time, the y-axis. Also, the piston is accelerating forward, as indicated by the curve that is not linear. As the piston moves at any point in time, it sends forward a sound wave that travels faster than the piston itself, if the piston is moving at a subsonic speed. This can be traced out by the first of the blue line here, at the beginning of the motion of the piston. As the piston moves forward, it is also going to compress the air in front of it slightly, increasing its pressure and temperature by a bit. This increase in temperature will also increase the sound speed of the air in this region. That increase in sound speed is shown in this second blue line, which is slightly slanted than the first blue line, indicating a faster sound speed. Because the piston is accelerating forward, it picks up its speed more and more as time goes on compressing the air in front of it more and more and increasing the sound speed of that region of air and we can see that increase of the sound speed by the successive blue lines on top of each other 
As the piston continues to move forward, all the blue lines collide into a single line. This indicates that all the sound waves produced by the piston motion will collide with each other, producing a shock wave that moves as one, far in front of the piston. Remember that, as we've learned previously, that sound wave is basically a very weak shock wave. And, as we've learned before, across the shock wave, the gas properties change. Before the shock, the air is stationary. Behind the shock, the air is now moving exactly with the same speed as the piston's speed. The air is also more compressed behind the shock compared to that in front of the shock. What really happened is that the compression is due to the motion of the piston that is pushing and compressing the air in front of it. The shock is actually the byproduct of the piston motion, not the primary cause of the piston motion. If you are interested to know more about this, you can refer to this article shown at the bottom of the screen. Here, you can see the full motion of a piston inside a two-stroke engine with four cycles. But no worries, in this course, we are just going to analyze the shock wave in a tube, not the whole details of the piston engine. The example of this piston engine is giving us the real-world context of where shock waves can occur which turns out to be inside a very common device that we use in our daily lives. Now, the piston moves by oscillating back and forth as it goes through the four cycles to produce power to rotate car wheels, for example. This motion of the piston can be represented by the graph of the piston displacement, as shown here, and the velocity of the piston motion is shown in this graph here. As the piston oscillates, it compresses and expands the gas sinusoidally. The forward motion of the piston compresses the gas. Its backward motion expands the gas, in a process called rarefaction. During this motion, at all time, sound waves are sent out, or radiated out, and multiple sound waves collapses into a single shock wave. The shock waves, in turn, moves forward at a faster velocity than the piston. Uh, this cycle repeats itself as the piston alternates back and forth. The changes of gas pressure with time can be represented by this graph here, showing that the gas pressure alternates from positive and negative, i.e. from compression and expansion. We will learn more about gas expansion in Chapter 7. Okay, now let's look at a more general case of a shockwave moving and reflecting of a wall inside a straight cylindrical tube. This flow can be done experimentally in a setup shown in this slide. The shock can be created by releasing a gas with high pressure suddenly into a gas with low pressure. That sudden release can be done by puncturing a diaphragm that separates the two gas regions. When this happens, the high pressure gas is going to flow at high speed into the low pressure gas. This instantaneous and big change in gas velocity and pressure is similar to an explosion. When the diaphragm is punctured, similar to a bomb being exploded, it sends out a shock wave, labeled as the incident shock here, that moves forward in front of the high pressure gas. Across the shock, the gas properties change according to the rules of the moving shock wave that we've learned before. So, the gas pressure is going to increase from the green zone in region 1 into the pitch zone in region 2. And the flow speed in region 2 is going to move towards the right behind the shock but with a slower speed. As it travels forward and hit the wall of the tube, it's going to be reflected off the wall, sending it to move in the opposite direction. Is going to be facing the flow in the pitch zone in region 2 that is itself moving towards the reflected shock. Across this reflected shock, the gas properties are going to change again, increasing the gas pressure even more than before, as shown in the red zone in region 3. I want to mention here that you should also refer to the main class notes because it contains other more detailed slides that are not shown in this video here. This video is produced to explain the core principles and ideas behind this topic so that you can use that ideas to think and understand about the extended cases shown in the class notes.
In the next slide, we're going to look at the strategies to solve problems on the reflected shock by calculating the gas properties behind the shock before the reflection, which is labeled as region 2 here, and after the reflection, which is labeled as region 3 here.